tutorial is titled Learning Repetitions of uh, Large-Scale Networks. Uh, it will be given by uh, Dr. Jian Tang, who's sitting over there. Uh, he uh, uh, is now with uh, HEC uh, Montreal, uh, the Montreal the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithm, uh, abbreviated as uh, MILA, right? Or MILA? MILA, right? MILA. Uh, and uh, my former student, uh, ooh, I'm not used to this. My former student, Chen Li, who's now, uh, who just joined Google, she's um, uh, waiting for her uh, work visa, so uh, there's risk for her to travel abroad. Uh, and then myself, uh, I'm Chao Zhumei uh, at the University of Michigan, by the way. So uh, let's start talking. All right, networks. Uh, who don't know networks, right? Networks are uh, everywhere. Uh, you see them uh, in uh, every aspect of our daily lives. You see uh, social networks. Uh, many of you are still using social networks right now, here. Uh, you uh, see road networks, uh, World Wide Web, and uh, technology networks, like Internet of Things. Uh, they are ubiquitous uh, in the world. Uh, but what's more important uh, of networks is that they provide a uh, very general structure of data, very general representation uh, of data. Um, so uh, to that regard, many types of data can be actually represented as networks. You talk about text, you talk about uh, uh, images, you talk about uh, uh, time series, you talk about many other types of data. They can all be formulated as networks. Uh, to show you some uh, interesting networks, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I know it's harder to get here than uh, some other places, so some of you may have already been uh, uh, investigating the uh, airline networks, uh, yeah, like I did. Um, so this is the, can you guess what this is? This is the network of the internet, as you can see. It's fancy, it's big. And uh, can you guess what this is? This is not biology. Uh, instead, uh, this is a network of uh, high school dating relationship. <laughs> it's collected from a high school uh, where every note uh, uh, corresponds to uh, a student. And you see the link uh, if they have dated. So you can actually find something very interesting here, like um, uh, there are hops, of course. There are passes. And the network somehow is uh, magically is connected, right? And this is a uh, uh, biology network. This is the gene regulatory network where every node is a gene, and uh, the edges corresponds to uh, uh, the regulatory relationship between the genes. So you can see that there are lots of examples of networks in the real world. Um, um, Upon those networks, there are also many uh, uh, data mining tasks. Um, so you can define lots of uh, learning tasks, mining tasks on top of any kind of these networks, and they will help us do lots of, uh, uh, interesting, so lots of interesting problems. For instance, link prediction is the key problem in networks. Uh, you can see that in a social network, you want to predict who will be a friend of whom later. And uh, if you think about the network as the information network, uh, or if you have nodes as people, have other set of nodes as items, you could also use link prediction to do recommendation, right? Another example is ranking, right? We like ranking, right? Uh, we rank ourselves based on how many citations we have. We rank ourselves based on, you know, uh, how, you know, how prestigious our programs are. So many of the cases, uh, these problems uh, involve the network, and you're ranking the nodes in the network based on either the degree or uh, centrality. A good example would be uh, PageRank, that ranks web pages on the, uh, the web network. Another example is community detection, right? And that's what we do all the time. Some of you choose to come here uh, to KDD. Some of you have just attended CKR or uh, ICML. So those are different communities of researchers. Uh, and if you map uh, the researchers on the network, uh, you can see that the communities correspond to clusters of people, clusters of nodes connected by uh, different edges. And then there are problems corresponding to uh, classification. Um, so for the nodes in a network, 
we can actually classify them uh, into uh, you know, different categories. We can assign labels to the nodes. For instance, uh, sometimes we label ourselves as uh, you know, uh, computer science researchers versus uh, uh, data science researchers. And that's one of the classification. And sometimes in a social network, we're finding uh, the opinion leaders, we're finding uh, you know, uh, community um, uh, you know, uh, observers, and uh, many different roles. Those are another problem of uh, node classification. And occasionally, we can also assign labels to edges. That means we can also classify uh, the edges, the relationship between two nodes into different categories. Well, another example would be uh, uh, resilience or robustness uh, of a network. So uh, in this world, uh, we are uh, watched, and uh, there are always people who want to attack our social system. Uh, some, to uh, um, understand what kind of attacks are more effective and how can we actually avoid those attacks. People are talking about how to actually construct uh, or uh, amend a network structure so that it's more robust to attacks. One particular uh, application would be uh, you know, uh, fighting rumors on a social network. Uh, how can you actually uh, uh, intervene the nodes so that uh, the harmful rumors won't actually uh, you know, spread far? And this is also related to another important task, to analyze the information cascades on a network. Rumors themselves are a perfect example of information cascades. There are many others, like opinions, like our research papers, like news articles, uh, like even just a single tweet. Uh, they are propagating uh, among different networks. Uh, one interesting question to ask is, can you predict how far uh, a piece of information could actually travel in a network? Or can you predict how many citations uh, the, the newest published papers at KDD will actually receive in five years? So these are all uh, basic uh, general data mining tasks defined on networks. There are by no means the only tasks defined on uh, networks. There are many other tasks uh, that we care about. For instance, how to sample a network so that uh, we can preserve the basic properties of the network. Uh, how to make recommendations on networks, how to recommend nodes to nodes, how to recommend edges to nodes, how to recommend communities to nodes. Um, we, we also do lots of uh, structural analysis to find graphic patterns, uh, to find these uh, motifs in um, um, gene regulatory networks, uh, to find structure holes in social networks, as we all know that uh, uh, nodes that span in uh, structure holes uh, shares uh, uh, big social capital. So there's a lot of work on this direction. Um, we also care about the evolution of networks. We care about the evolution of uh, the KDD community uh, in the past 20 years, right? Uh, and we also care about matching. Uh, uh, as you know that you use Facebook, you use Snapchat, you use uh, many different other networks. Uh, can we actually match the nodes in one network to the nodes in another network, right? We also care about visualizations of networks, not just to visualize networks per se, but to visualize big data uh, through the construction of networks. So we will touch some of these tasks uh, later in this talk. So networks are so powerful and there are so many interesting data mining tasks defined on networks, right? The question is, what kind of representations networks gave us to facilitate these tasks? You know, the definition of networks is quite simple. A network is essentially just a bunch of nodes connected by edges, right? So if we represented that mathematically, uh, we could just simply use the uh, affiliation matrix where, uh, the, um, oops, where the number of rows and the number of columns corresponds to the nodes. Sometimes we have one node network, so it will be a symmetric matrix. Sometimes we have two node networks. Uh, we have a, a set of nodes as users and another set of nodes as items where we have a, a non-symmetric network. And the numbers in every cell in this uh, uh, matrix corresponds to the weights, the importance of the edges connecting the two nodes. So that's fairly uh, straightforward. Um, but there's the huge problem with this uh, simple and you know, elegant mathematic uh, representation of networks. Uh, so one problem you can see that in this matrix, most of the entries are zeros, right? It makes sense, because think about how many users are there on Facebook, 
and how many friendship links are there, right? So needless to say, most of the edges are zeros in this. So this uh, simple representation suffers from data sparseness, right? It also suffers from very, the extremely high dimensionality, right? Think about the billions of users uh, on Facebook. You will actually have a matrix of billions of dimensions. And that creates a huge problem when you're actually using the matrix for the downstream data mining tasks, right? And to this regard, this simple representation does not facilitate fast computation uh, of, uh, um, you know, many mining tasks. They does not capture the semantics of the networks, and yet they're just too large to actually deal with, right? So to solve these problems, we're aiming to find a better representation of networks, a better representation that is compact enough that represents the semantics, the meanings of the network, and that facilitates fast representation, fast computation. Okay, so this is actually the, the key problem we will actually uh, introduce in this talk. So the major challenge um, of uh, uh, finding the representation of networks is of course finding something better than the affiliation matrix. We want to find representations uh, of networks that are efficient and effective to actually facilitating the, the downstream uh, data mining tasks, right? There are two major challenges of this, if we summarize that. The first major challenge is the scale, right? It's probably simple to find a representation of uh, you know, networks of thousands of nodes, but when we scale that up to millions of nodes or to billions of nodes, how can we still find such a representation and how can we find it efficiently? Um, the other big challenge is actually uh, about the network itself, right? In most real uh, world problems, we're not just dealing with, um, you know, um, simple networks with, uh, you know, clean semantics. We're actually dealing with heterogeneous networks, heterogeneous information networks, where nodes could actually have different categories. Edges could have different types. Uh, and there are rich information defined on the nodes, on the edges, right? There could be directed links, there could be undirected links, right? There could be uh, labeled uh, nodes, there could be unlabeled nodes. Sometimes the orders of nodes matter, sometimes they don't. So there's a huge, variety, huge diversity among the semantics in the network. Um, so that's why uh, finding the right representation of networks has always been a very hard task. But we're trying to solve this, right? We're trying to tell you how to solve this. Um, the basic approaches of finding network representations can be roughly uh, introduced uh, in one sentence. From, whoops. <laughs> From the organic representation of network, that is a bunch of nodes connected by nice, what we're going to do is to find uh, continuous uh, vector representations of nodes. So we're mapping the nodes and we're mapping the substructures of networks into continuous semantic space. And based on this so-called uh, uh, network embeddings, we're going to facilitate the, the downstream tasks, including like classification, clustering, and link prediction, uh, recommendations, and so forth. So what's more important here is how to actually match this discrete network structure into the continuous semantic space, right? And uh, there are lots of objectives that you, you can actually describe for this continuous semantic space. They have to be compact, they have to be no dimensional, and they have to be, uh, you know, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, the dimensions should be orthogonal, right? So most of the uh, techniques are trying to find this continuous representation of nodes, of edges, and of uh, the network structures as a whole to fancy the, the downstream tasks. Okay, for instance, one example is that if you take the social network of Facebook, uh, of course, you know, if you can, uh, how to actually find the representations of the users, how to actually map every user of the social network, uh, of the Facebook network into the continuous space that is of a, a high dimension or a low dimension. And then how can you make use of this embedding, make use of this dimensional space to actually do a friend recommendation, right? This is one example of learning the representations of network. You can see that if we can find such a representation of networks, we can actually apply it to solve a much broader range of problems. And that, the reason of that is uh, the networks themselves 
provide the simple representation of data in general, right? For instance, uh, if you think about text mining, right, we can easily construct networks from the uh, original text data. For instance, we can actually construct word networks, construct document networks from the text data. And then if we have a powerful tool to learn the representations of the network, then the uh, representation we learned for the network would actually serve as uh, uh, you know, uh, an efficient representation of the original text data. And then that would actually facilitate us to do uh, lots of uh, uh, text mining tasks, right? If you replace text with images, if you replace text with user behaviors, you can, again, do this uh, practice. You construct the network from the original data and then use the network representation learning methods to learn the uh, uh, efficient uh, representations and then use that to solve downstream data mining tasks. Right, so network representation is important and it's quite general. Right, another thing you could do, which is quite interesting, is to visualize uh, big networks to uh, 2D or 3D dimensions. Right, uh, this usually creates us with the beautiful, uh, you know, visualizations. Some of them you have already seen, like the internet and like the airline is easy, and like the high school dating network, right? How to actually lay out a network in a 2D and 3D space so that we can actually um, you know, tell the audience what it looks like and what the most important information, uh, what the most important patterns are in the network. This is essentially also the representation learning task, right? You can see the only difference between this one and the one I showed in previous slide is that you are now finding a two-dimensional or three-dimensional uh, vector space for the nodes, right? And similarly, this is also, uh, so these are kind of a uh, um, visualization that you can create. Suppose you can actually find this 2D or 3D uh, representations of nodes, right? And interestingly, uh, as we said, this whole practice can, uh, can be applied to, to any type of data, as long as you can actually construct the network out of it, right? So that is, if you have the need to actually visualize a large set of text data or a large set of gene sequence data, you can easily do that. The only thing you need to do is to construct a network from the original data and then to visualize the network, right, using the same techniques. So we will also uh, uh, introduce the methods how to actually visualize large-scale networks in this talk. By the way, this is one example that we created in one of our recent work to visualize uh, uh, 10 million scientific papers on a single slide. So the data was taken from the uh, Microsoft Academia and you can actually see that uh, there are literally 10 million points, every point uh, corresponds to the scientific paper. What we can see clearly from this visualization is that uh, there are research communities. There are research fields. Uh, if you want to ask where computer science is, uh, it's actually scattered over there. Uh, and what are the fields that are the closest to computer science? Mathematics over here. And surprisingly, economics is over here. It's quite close to computer science. Um, you can say physics, and biology, they're on two, you know, extremes. So apparently they don't talk to each other, right? <laughs> and uh, you can also see chemistry that is much closer to uh, uh, biology than uh, physics. You can also see medicine. Medicine lies actually in between uh, biology, uh, chemistry, and a bunch of uh, social sciences. So to create such a visualization, you really need a powerful tool that can actually uh, learn the 2D, uh, sometimes 3D representations of 10 million data points, of 10 million nodes efficiently. That's something we will also cover in this talk. Um, so suppose you can actually find efficient representations of nodes. That means if you can find a vector space and map the nodes into the vector space, Sometimes we also need to find such a representation of the whole network, of the network as a whole, right? And uh, think about the tasks. If you just want to do like node classification, maybe finding the node representation is good enough, right? If you want to do recommendation, okay, all you need to do is to find the representation of the two nodes, right? But sometimes our data mining tasks uh, requires us to actually understand the semantics of entire networks, such as community detection. Right, such as to predict the information cascades. 
In, to that regard, we need a way to actually find the continuous representation of the entire network of much larger structures, right, from nodes, right? In those uh, cases, we will need to find other methods rather than just aggregating the node representations of the network. We will also introduce uh, methods that are finding the representations for entire graphs. All right. So this is the outline uh, of this tutorial. Uh, the, tutor the tutorial can be uh, uh, partitioned into uh, you know, three major parts plus uh, uh, part four for summary. Uh, so in the first part, we will talk about uh, how to learn the node representations of network. That is a basic task. That is also the most mature work uh, in literature. The goal is to uh, find continuous uh, vector spaces uh, that can actually map every node in the network into the high or low dimensional space. Uh, and in part two, we will particularly talk about how to visualize large scale networks. That means how to find the extremely small dimensional uh, representations of um, uh, networks. How to map the nodes into 2D or 3D dimensions uh, quickly. Um, and then in part three, we will talk about how to actually learn the representation of much larger uh, structures. Not from nodes, not edges, but larger structures, sometimes entire networks, right? And then we will summarize. Uh, we will uh, talk about the summary and future work. Um, so uh, from here, I will hand this tutorial to uh, Dr. Tang, who will actually talk about uh, uh, some uh, the literature and his own uh, excellent work. Uh, and then I will come back after the coffee break. Thank you. So thanks, Josh, for the nice introduction. So, so next, I'm going to talk about how to learn node representations. Um, so basically, I will cover three parts. So first part is about the relative work to uh, node embedding, including like uh, classic methods like uh, Laplace and eigen maps, and also uh, word embeddings. Then, uh, then we are talking about uh, the state of, uh, the state art approach for node embedding, including mo two, uh, three models: um, uh, so outline model, deep work model, and node vector. So then I will talk about some extension to, the, to this work. So, so let me start by um, defining the problem of node embedding uh, in a formal way. So given a network, um, so G, so V is a set of uh, nodes in the network, and uh, E is a set of edges between the nodes, and W is the set of ways um, of the edges um, uh, between the nodes. So the goal of node embedding is to represent each node with a low dimension vector. In other words, so each node will be uh, represented with a low dimension vector. And in this low dimension space, so we want to preserve the similarities between the nodes. And in other words, we want to preserve the structures of the networks in this node, uh, node dimension space. And so there are many uh, rate work uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, node embedding. So for example, uh, classical graph embedding algorithms. This include models like uh, multi-dimensional scaling, uh, isomap, uh, Laplace and Aiken maps. So these algorithms usually work pretty well on small uh, networks, but they are very hard, very hard to scale up to, read, uh, to very large networks. Uh, there are also some recent work based on metric fractionation, which can uh, be scaled up to very large networks. However, so metric fractionation is not uh, designed specific for learning node repetitions. Um, so the performance is, is usually not so good. And, and it's only a, uh, uh, useful for undirected graphs. And, and the learning node embeddings also vary rate to word embeddings, which basically learn the repetitions uh, of the words from word sequence. So comparing to uh, word embeddings, so node repetition is essentially uh, learning node repetitions from networks with arbitrary structures. So, so next I'm going to introduce some of this work in more details. Uh, so I will first talk about uh, the classical graph embedding algorithms, Laplace and map. So the essential idea of Laplace and Eigen map is that so the embeddings of the similar nodes should be close to each other. And based on this um, intuition, so we have the following object function. So basically here, the, the vector ui is an embedding of node i, and the, and the uh, vector uj is an embedding of node j, and the wij is, WIJ is is the weight of the uh, the weight of the edge between the two nodes. So basically, this object function measures the smooth smoothness of the node embeddings in terms of the network structures. Okay, 
And then we can first refine this uh, object function in, in, a, in, in a matrix form. So here the, um, the matrix U is a concatenation of, of all the node embeddings, okay? And, and the matrix L is a Laplace matrix, which is the difference between two matrix, uh, the, uh, the difference between matrix D and the matrix W. So matrix W is a efficient matrix of the networks. And D is a di diagonal matrix with um, value in the diagonal correspond to the degree of the node. Um, so based on this object function, um, so we want to find the optimal node embeddings, and this usually can be uh, uh, so by finding the eigenvectors of the, uh, the smallest uh, eigenvalues of the Laplace matrix based on this formula. So however, in practice, if you want to solve, um, um, you want to find the eigenvectors, it's usually very computation expensive, and this makes it, make it uh, infeasible when the network becomes very large, okay? And so this is the Laplace, egg, Laplace eigenmaps. So another uh, very rich work is word embedding. Word embedding model, the skip grant model, uh, uh, model, so which is a state of the art approach for learning word embeddings. So the goal of word embedding is to represent each word with a low dimension vector, say like the, uh, word vec uh, the vector vi. So the training data is a word sequence. Uh, so the sequence can be very huge, right? And so, and the, the essential intuition of what embedding is is based on the distribution hypothesis. So, which is said that so you know a word by the company it keeps. In other words, uh, it basically is, it means like the meaning of word can be represented by the word it co-occur. So, this is the essential idea of um, uh, of word embeddings. And based on this uh, intuition, uh, the skip uh, model proposed to learn the word repetitions by predicting the nearby words, nearby words within a window. So more specifically, let's say, given a, a window of text, and, and, this, is, and this WT is the, the center of, the, of, 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 of this uh, text, and we want to predict the nearby words. For example, we want to uh, predict uh, WT minus one, WT uh, minus two, and also want to predict WT uh, plus one, WT plus two, okay? So we want to predict the nearby words uh, based on the current word, okay? And this prediction is, uh, uh, is achieved by using this uh, uh, probability function, and this, and this is defined in terms of the softmax function, okay? And here we have to uh, have, so we, here we have different types of embeddings here. So the VWI is the embedding of the center word, okay? Which is, is the input of the uh, neural network, and the embedding of V prime WO is the embedding of the, uh, the nearby word, which is also the output of the neural network, okay? So, so note that here, um, actually, so in this model, every word, every word can have two, um, have two embeddings. So one embedding when, when the word is in the center word, okay, uh, which is the input of the model, and another, embed when, another embedding for, for the case when the word is in the output of the model or, in, uh, or when the words uh, appear in the uh, nearby positions, okay? So every word has two types of embed embeddings. And the, the, the object function of skip gram, gram model is to maximize the likelihood of all the predictions, the prediction from the center word to the nearby positions. So here T is the number of words in the training sequence, and the C is the window size. And uh, in practice, uh, directly optimize this object function is actually very computation expensive because you can see that for these uh, object functions, um, uh, and this is a softmax function. In order to calculate this um, softmax function, so we need to calculate the partition function, which needs to uh, iterate over all the uh, entire vocabulary. And this becomes very expensive when the number of words uh, in the data set becomes very large, okay? So, and to solve this problem, um, the, the author of the skip, skip grant model proposed a technique of next sampling. So, so remember that, so we want to maximize this probability, right? In order to maximize this probability, this can be achieved by maximizing the new numerator. Basically, what the model did is trying to push the embedding of the center word close to the embedding of the, of the ne nearby word, like the embedding of this word uh, close to the embedding of this word, okay? And this is by maximizing the numerator. And also, we, we try to minimize the embedding of the we're also trying to minimize in the denominator, which essentially try to push uh, the embedding of the center words stay away from the uh, embedding all of all the words in, in, in the vocabulary, okay? 
because the number was in the vocabulary is very large, so uh, what the negative sampling uh, algorithm did is to, we can just sample some words and just push the embedding of the center words, stay away from the, the sampled words. But the problem is how can we sample? So they also proposed to sample from a distribution, so which is called the noise distribution. And usually the noise distribution is set as uh, the unigram model, the unigram uh, distributions. So basically it said that if a word is very popular, we want the center word stay away from the most popular word. So that's the essential idea of, um, of negative sampling. So inspired by the inspired by the Nekti, um, inspired by the uh, skipping model, we propose a very scalable model called Line for learning the node repetitions. So Line has a uh, uh, several advantage. So so, so first is is it is it can be used for any uh, type of networks, including you know uh, directed, undirected, and weighted. And Line has a very clear object function. It aims to uh, preserve the so first order and also second order proximity between the nodes in the networks. So I will talk about the definition of uh, first order and the second order proximity later. And Line is also very scalable. It's, um, it's optimized through a synchronous stochastic gradient descent. That means it can be opt optimized with multiple threads. And it only takes um, a couple hours to to embed a network with millions of nodes and the billions of edges um, on a single machine, so which is very efficient, right? Um, so coming back to the object function of network embedding, so what 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 do you, what do you think? What is the right objective uh, objective net, network representation? So it's natural it's natural to assume that uh, for a good um, uh, for a good uh, network embedding, uh, the, pro the the similarity of the nodes, the it's natural to assume that in the low dimension space, we can uh, actually preserve the proximity of the nodes on the original network. And, and here the proximity can be actually interpreted differently. So one type of uh, proximity is the first order proximity. So which basically uh, said that uh, two nodes, are, uh, two nodes are, are similar to each other if there's a link between them. So which is referred to the, you know, the local pairwise proximity. So local pairwise, pro so which is, for example, for these two nodes, if there's a very, um, uh, if, there's a, um, is, if there's an edge, which is uh, the value of the, the weight, of, the value of the weight, which is very large, then these two nodes are very uh, similar to each other. So first order possibility is actually uh, leveraged by many existing graph embedding algorithms, like say the Laplace and Maps. However, so in many real world networks, uh, many links between the nodes are not observed. In other words, using first order proximity is not, um, is not sufficient uh, for preserving the entire network, struct network structures. And we must, to, we must uh, introduce other type of proximity. So therefore, we also um, introduce uh, another type of proximity, which is called the second order proximity. So second order proximity between the nodes is defined as uh, the proximity uh, between the neighborhood structures. So you know, in other words, if the two nodes, they have a lot of common neighbors, they're likely to be uh, similar to each other. And, and this is, uh, for example, in social network, if two people, they have a lot of common friends, they're likely to be, ha have similar interests, right? And another example is that for two words, if they co-occur with many common words, they're, li they're likely to have, this, have, have similar meanings, okay? So this is a second order proximity. So, so, so next, I'm going to introduce how can we uh, preserve the first order and also second order proximity in the low dimension space. <coughs> um, so to preserve the first order proximity, so we first, uh, we first define uh, the empirical distribution of the first order proximity. So for example, uh, given, a node, given a pair of node i and j, so we define the, uh, the, the, the first order proximity of the two nodes, that's the proximity uh, we observed. Uh, which is proportional to the, um, to the weight of the edge uh, between the two nodes, Wij, and then it's normalized by the weights of all the edges in the network. So this is the, the first order proximity we, we observe in practice, okay? So this is something we observe on the original network. And then we also define uh, the proximity of the two nodes in low dimension spaces, so which, it, which it depends on their um, uh, low dimension re repetitions. So here, uh, the, uh, the vector ui uh, is the embedding of node i, so, and the, the first order proximity is, is defined based on a, a softmax function. So basically, you can see that if two nodes, 
if the embedding of the two nodes, UI and the UJ, are close to, are close to each other in the low dimension space, and it's, it's likely the two nodes are very similar, right? And in order to preserve the first order proximity, and we can just uh, minimize the distance between the empirical distribution and the model distribution. And for the, dis for the distance between two uh, probabilistic distributions, we use the KL divergence. And, and, and this object function can finally uh, be simplified into this way, which is very, sim which is very simple, okay? So this is how, uh, how, can we, uh, how we can uh, preserve the first order possibility. And, and for, the second order pos for the second order possibility, remember that the second order possibility between the nodes is a possibility of the neighborhood structures. So therefore, in order to preserve the second order possibility, we just need to, we just need to preserve the proximity. Um, we just need to uh, preserve the neighborhood structure of every node. So then, therefore, we first define the neighborhood, neighborhood structure for every node. So empirically, for every node, we define the uh, probability from node i to its neighbor uh, to uh, the probability from node i to its neighbor as, as the weight of the edge between the two nodes, and it's uh, normalized by the degree of the node. So this is, um, so this is the probability we ob observe in practice, okay? And then also, we can also define uh, the neighborhood structure in terms of the load, in terms of the node dimension represent representations. And we define the probability from node i to node j in the node in the low dimension space uh, using the soft softmax function. So here the vector u i prime is the embedding of node i when i is the source node of the, the edge, and uh, and the vector u j um, is the embedding of node j when when the when the node j is a target node. Okay. Um, so, so here, basically, every node has two, two type, has also, also has two type of embeddings. So one embedding when the node is a source node, and another embedding when the node is a, is a target node, okay? And to preserve the second order possibility, we can just uh, preserve the, um, the neighborhood structure for every node. And, and then we can just um, uh, minimize distance between the empirical distribution and also the model distribution. And for the, dis uh, for the distance between the two distributions, we can still use KL divergence, okay? And the final object function can, can be still um, uh, be simplified into a very, uh, very simple form, okay? And this is how can we, and how can we preserve the second order possibility. And for optimization, uh, we, okay, sure. This one, okay. Um, so let me see. Um, yeah, I guess um, there's some mis mistake here, and you're, and you're right. I think it's the case over uh, here, right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so the case should be uh, over the out 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 degree out, out node, right? Okay. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, so for optimization, uh, we use uh, uh, st stochastic gradient descent. Basically, um, in every st in every step in every step we render sample an, an edge and then do its optimization. And as, as, as we can see that in this object function, we also have the softmax function, so which is very computation expensive. And also in order to speed up the optimization, we also use uh, the technique of negative sampling, which is also used in the technique of word embeddings. And then basically in, in every step, we render sample a positive edge and also multiple um, ne uh, negative edges for optimization. And, and when we do the optimization, we calculate the gradient with respect to the embeddings. For example, we are given the edge i and j, and we, 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 we calculate the, the gradient with respect to the node embedding ui. So we can see that uh, when we do, when we do the cal uh, calculation, the embedding, uh, the, object, the, the gradient um, uh, with respect to the node embedding ui, uh, th so this embedding is actually um, proportional to the weight of the edges between the two nodes. So when you do the, when you calculate the node embeddings, and it's actually proportional to the weight of the edge between the nodes. So, uh, so this can be problematic uh, when the, uh, the variance of the weight of the edges becomes very huge. For example, uh, the weight of some edges can be very large, for, for example, 1,000. And, um, and for, some, uh, for some edge, the weight can be very small, like one. So in this case, and the gradient, the variance of the gradient can be very huge, okay? And this will make the optimization uh, loose. 
So in order to solve this problem, um, we proposed a technique called like edge sampling. So basically what we did is like, we sampled the edges uh, um, uh, with the probability proportion to their weights, and then we treat the sampled edges as binary. So because if all the if, if the weights of all the edges are binary, then this problem doesn't exist, right? If all the double edge equals to one, then this problem doesn't exist. So we propose the um, the technique called edge sampling. So we sample the edges with the probability proportion to their weights, and then treat treat the sampled edges as binary. So you can you can go back to this object function. If you like sample the uh, you sample the edges uh, with, the with the probability proportion to their weights, and then treat the sample edges uh, as binary, then the overall object function remains the same, right? For example, if, the, if here uh, there's an edge, the weights can be 10, and then you can just treat as uh, 10, 10 edges, 10 binary edges. In this case, object function remains the same, but the problem can be solved, okay? And the final, uh, the final complexity of the overall com uh, optimization is actually very efficient, which is linear to the dimension uh, uh, d, uh, d and the number of negative samples k and also the number of edges, which is very efficient. Um, there are also some practical issues of node repetitions. So one, uh, one practical issue is how can we uh, very accurate, accurately uh, uh, embed nodes with small degrees, right? And so, so we propose to uh, expand the the neighbors of the nodes uh, by adding high, high order neighbors, for example, uh, neighbors of neighbors. And we use a search strategy called like um, uh, breath, uh, first search. So basically we, we first add the neighbor, we first add uh, the neighbors of nodes and then we add neighbors of neighbors. So in practice we found that, we found that like the second order neighbors uh, works pretty well in most cases. So, so this is one practical issue. So another um, uh, practical issue is like because networks are dynamic so, for example, in one in one in so one in one time period, you already are embedding uh, every node in the network, and the, and then a, a new coming node comes can, can, can in. How can you embed the, the new coming nodes? So, so the solution is that so you can just fix the embeddings of the existing nodes, and then do the optimization uh, with respect to the embeddings of the new nodes. Okay. So this is how can we embed new nodes. So besides line, uh, another well-known approach for node embedding is uh, is called deep work. So basically, line and deep work, deep work is uh, de developed independently, and the essential idea of deep work is to learn the node repetitions using the te technique for uh, for learning word repetitions. In other words, the skip word model. So in order to use the skip word model for learning uh, node embeddings, we must have sentences uh, in the networks. So here uh, in deep, uh, in, the, in deep work. They treat the random works on networks um, as sentences, and then apply sk skip and model on the sentence to, to to learn the node embeddings. So basically, in deep work, they have their algorithms have two steps. So one step is generate random works uh, from the original networks. For example, we can generate the load sequence from uh, three one one uh, five one. So this is the node sequence, and treat this sequence as um, as a sentence. And then, as as what is done in skip grant model, so we want to predict the nearby uh, word or here nearby node. So we want to predict uh, using node one to predict node three, and using node one to predict node uh, five. And the prediction is still uh, the same using the same formula used in uh, in skip grant model, which is a softmax function. Okay. And for optimization, we can see that the, uh, the optimization is still very uh, computation expensive if just op optimization in a direct way because uh, here we have softmax function and uh, we need to uh, calculate the partition function which need to calculate the, uh, which, which need to iterate over the entire vocabulary, entire node. Uh, so in deep work, they, they use the technique called like hierarchical softmax, so which is proposed by Maureen and Benjo in 2005. So the essential idea of uh, hierarchical softmax is that, so we can we can construct a binary tree, um, and and the and the leaf of the node, uh, uh, the leaf of the tree, trees correspond to the nodes of uh, in the networks. Okay, so so when we do the prediction. For example, we want to pr uh, predict. Uh, we, so given node one, we want to pr pr predict node three. Then this corresponds to uh, predict a path from the root. From the root node to the to the leaf of the node, right? So, so for example, suppose we want to start from the root. Uh, so, suppose we are given uh, node one, and we want to predict uh, node three. Then, essentially, we are just trying to predict a path in this binary tree, right? 
when we do the prediction, essentially we are trying to like do a do a binary decisions in every uh, internal node, right? So by doing this, we are able to reduce the complexity of the uh, algorithm from linear to the number nodes to to logarithm to the number nodes. So which can speed up the whole uh, op optimization process. Okay. So besides uh, besides line and deep work, uh, the third well-known um, approach for node repetition is called uh, node to vector. Uh, which is proposed by uh, Grover and Leskovic in 2016. So remember that uh, in line, uh, the approach of expanding the node context or the approach of expanding the neighbors, we use a, a, a strategy called like uh, breeze first uh, search. And for for deep work, because uh, we are actually gener generating random works from every node. So essentially, for deep work, we are we are expand the neighbors or expand the neighbor the node context uh, using a, in a random way. So, so the node, uh, node to vector propose an um, approach uh, to find the node context uh, using a combination of uh, breadth for sampling and also uh, depth, sample, uh, depth, uh, depth for sampling. So essentially, the breadth for sampling and try to model uh, homophily in uh, social networks, and the depth for sampling are essentially trying to model the structural equivalence. For example, in these networks, uh, the nodes uh, U and S6 are similar to each other because they have the uh, similar structure roles of a half node in the two communities. That's why they are similar to each other, okay? Um, to effectively, uh, to balance the uh, breeze first uh, search strategy and also the depth uh, first search strategy, um, so node vector proposed to expand the node context with bias random work. So essentially, the bias random work uh, have, has two parameters, P and Q. So the parameter P, the parameter P can choose the probability of Revising node in the work and the parameter Q controls the probability of uh, exploring alter alter nodes. So based on we based, so basically with these two parameters, we um, the the model can control uh, whether to do uh, breadth first search strategy or depth first uh, uh, or depth first search strategy. And in practice, um, the optimal values of the parameter P and Q are found by cross validation on on neighbor data. Okay. And the optimization is uh, is done by uh, by the by a similar objective as line with first order possibility. Okay. So after introducing the three objectives, let's uh, have a, a systematic comparison between line deep work and node vector. So what are the difference between the three models? Uh, so the first um, the first one is uh, the way of uh, neighbor is neighbor expansion or the way of finding node context. So for line, we use the approach of uh, breeze, breeze first uh, search strategy. Basically, we always find the, the neighbors first, and then we find neighbors, neighbors, okay? And that's how line uh, to find the node context. And for deep work, because deep work's uh, trying to generate uh, uh, random works from the nodes, so essentially trying to uh, uh, expand the uh, node uh, context uh, in a random way. And node to vector proposed to um, a, a hybrid uh, strategy trying to uh, balance between the breadth first search strategy and also the depth first search, search strategy. So in terms of the uh, proximity between the nodes, um, so line uh, use both uh, first order and also second order proximity, and deep work um, uh, essentially try, essentially use the second order proximity, which is uh, according to uh, the, the definition of line, and node to vector use uh, the first order proximity according to the, the definition of line. Okay, so this is the possibility uh, used by the three models. So in terms of optimization, uh, for both line and node vector, uh, so negative sampling are used for the optimization and deep work use hierarchical softmax. So if, in practice, like if you have, if you have a really large network, negative sampling are, are usually much faster and also effective. But if you have a small networks and hierarchical softmax can be more effective, especially for especially for nodes with small degrees. So that's the difference between um, hierarchical softmax and negative sampling. Uh, in terms of label data, both line and, and the deep work doesn't require label data, but uh, node vector requires label data because it needs label data to find the optimal parameters of the P and Q, uh, which is try to balance the, the uh, breadth first search strategy and also the depth first search strategy. So, so that's basically the um, um, uh, systematic comparison between the three models. Okay, so node, uh, so node, uh, learning node embeddings has has a lot of applications 
For example, the node embeddings can be used as features uh, for classification and then can also be used uh, to to learn the node, uh, uh, to, learn extreme, uh, to learn the uh, coordinates of the nodes for vis visualization purpose. And we can also use node embeddings to calculate the similarities between the nodes so that we can use tasks for like um, uh, link prediction and recommendation. And also since the network is a very uh, general data structure, so learning node embeddings can also be used in other applications. For example, we can use for uh, text rep repetitions. So we can construct networks from text and then with the embedding the text networks and which we can uh, um, we can uh, obtain the text embeddings. Okay, so so next I'm going to introduce some results of these applications. So let's start with the uh, um, the task of node classifications. So basically, so we are given a social network and by applying the the node embeddings on the social networks. So every node uh, here, so every user can be uh, will be represented as a low dimension vector, which can be used as features. And then we, we classify the users into different communities. In other words, we use the community, community identities as the classification labels. Um, so we can see that uh, in this uh, Flickr network, uh, deep work outperforms Laplace and AK maps. So note that uh, this uh, network is very small, so that Laplace Laplace egg maps can still uh, durable on this network. So we can see that on this network, deep work uh, already outperforms Laplace egg maps. Egg maps, and we also have the uh, the results on very uh, large network, which is the YouTube network. So we can see that on this network, so line with the second order postmid outperforms uh, deep work. So this is because line used the search strategy of the or uh, breeze first uh, search strategy, and but but deep work used. Um, um, uh, search, uh, uh, search uh, random uh, search strategy to expand the node context, okay? And the combination of the first and the second order possibility achieve the best results. Uh, and no, uh, node embeddings can be also used for uh, node visualization. So, so once uh, we have a node embedding for every node and we can first uh, uh, um, map the, the node embeddings to very low dimension space like two dimensional or three dimension spaces and then we can visualize uh, uh, the, the entire nodes in, 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 a, in one slide. So here we construct um, a coarse network from, uh, with papers from three uh, research fields, uh, data mining, machine learning, and computer vision. And these are the visualizations uh, generate, generated with embeddings uh, learned from with different models. So we can see that the visualization generated by line with second order possibility outperforms the, uh, the visualization generated by the embeddings learned by deep work. And, uh, and the significant outperforms the uh, visualization generated by uh, graph fragmentation. Okay. And, and, and with node embeddings, we can calculate the similarities between the nodes which can be used for tasks like link prediction. So these are the results of uh, link prediction. So we can see that the, the node embeddings either with line, deep work, or node vector, or outperforms classical methods for link prediction, such as uh, Jack Harder's coefficient and the Adamic Ada, so which essentially uh, measures the, the, uh, the overlap, overlap of the of neighbors. Okay. So as mentioned previously, uh, because the network is a very uh, general data structure, so we can also construct so we can also apply uh, node embeddings to other applications by constructing networks from, from other data. For example, we can construct uh, text networks from unstructured text. So here we can construct uh, the, uh, the word concurrency network from the unstructured text. So every node is a word, and the weight uh, of the edge between the nodes is, uh, is, uh, um, is uh, the number of co-occurrence co um, in all the local context windows, and then we can call the uh, word co-occurrence network. And by embedding the word co-occurrence network, then we can, we can obtain a, a, a reputation for every word. And we can also construct the word document network, so, so which is essentially a bypass network. So, so, and the weight between uh, the every word and every document is the frequency of this word in the document. And by embedding the word document network, we can actually ob obtain both word embeddings and also document embeddings, okay? And, and, and we vary the quality of the word embeddings using the task of word analogy, which is a typical task for word, word rep representation evaluation. So we construct a word concurrency network from the entire Wikipedia articles, uh, which contains uh, uh, two million words. So we, we throw away the uh, low, low frequency words and then it contains around two million words and one billion edges. And then, then by embedding the word co-occurrence uh, networks, we can actually obtain the word embeddings. 
And these are results of, the, of different algorithms for learning word embeddings on the task of word analogy, basically the largest better. So we can see that um, line with, um, line with uh, second order proximity outperforms line with first order proximity. And this is reasonable because two words co occur with each other doesn't mean, necessarily mean they are similar to each other, right? But if two words, they co occur with many common words, they are more likely to have similar meanings. So that's why line with second order proximity outperforms line with uh, first order proximity. And we, we are also surprising to see that the line with second order proximity to learn the word embeddings can actually outperform the state art approach for learning word embeddings, the, the skip model, so which learns word embeddings from the original um, word sequence. Uh, th so this is because like, um, the word co-occurrence network can capture the global distribution of the, words, uh, of the word co-occurrence compared, compared to the original word sequence. So that's why uh, 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 we construct a word coherence network from the from the text first, and then we embed the word coherence network. That's why can, we can get better, better word embedding results. Okay. So another advantage of this approach is that it's much more efficient, especially when you have a really large data set. So this is because when you increase the size of data uh, data set, like increase the uh, size of text, if you fix the vocabulary size and the size of the word coherence network, we are not grow linear to the size of data, right? And the, the only change is the, the weights between the words. So in other words, if you will increase the size of text and the size of what the concurrent networks will not grow linear to the data size. So this, so this approach can be uh, very, uh, very uh, efficient when the number of text becomes very huge. Right? And we also uh, evaluate the quality of the word repetitions using the task of test classification. So we construct the, the word concurrent network and the word document network from, um, to learn the word embeddings. And for document embedding, we just take the average uh, word embeddings in the documents, uh, so which is used uh, for document classification. Um, so here are the results of different algorithms for, um, for te uh, test classification. So we can see that uh, on, on, in the task of test classification, like with word co network, um, still still outperforms a skip, uh, skip Skip gram, gram, uh, skip gram model. So the reason is the same because uh, the word coherence network can capture the global distribution of the word coherence, and and on not. So these are results on non documents, and we can see that on doc, on non documents, so line with the word document network actually outperforms line with uh, word coherence network. So this is because on non documents, the word document network actually captures the document level word coherence information, which is more inform which is more informative than the, uh, the word coherence network, which actually captures the local context level word coherence information, right? So in other words, like on, on non-documents, document level word coherence information are more informative than local context level word coherence information. And we also have the results of uh, uh, text classification on, on short documents. We can see that um, line with, on, so this result is the same, but interesting, we can see that on short documents, line with the word coherence network actually can outperform line with word document networks. So this is because on short documents networks, the document level word coherence information uh, is very sparse, right? So that's why it doesn't perform so well. So if you if you are familiar with topic models like LDA, so basically what LDA is trying to, what, um, so what does LDA uh, do is, is to learn topics based on the uh, word document network, right? Which also trying to leverage the document level or uh, word co-occurrence information. And when the short when the on short text uh, topic model also doesn't work so well. So in practice, when when you are you have a, a bunch of short text and you apply topic model and it doesn't work, and then uh, so what people usually do is you construct the word co-occurrence network first and then apply topic models on the word coherence network. So here the, um, the, the, be the behavior of uh, word embedding, uh, ne uh, network embedding and the topic model have the same, uh, uh, have, have the same, uh, have the same observation, observation, okay? Sure, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Okay, um, I see. So yes, yes, yes. The question is like, uh, what's the performance using uh, our technique compared to like uh, technique using TF-IDF, right? Yeah. 
Uh, I think I have the results uh, in uh, in in the next uh, slides. Uh, not, uh, in the um, in the coming slides, but um, the basic uh, conclusion is that uh, if you if you're just using word embeddings learned in this way, you will not outperform TF IDF. The reason is that. So the word embeddings learned here is in, learned in an unsupervised, unsupervised way. That's why you actually cannot uh, beat uh, TF-IDF. But we do uh, know this issue and we, pro uh, we propose a semi-supervised uh, word embedding technique. In that case, we can outperform uh, TF-IDF very signif significantly. So I will also talk about that in the later. So yeah, so word embeddings if you learned in a supervised way, you can out outperform TF-IDF. But if learned in an unsupervised way, you cannot outperform TF-IDF. So that's the takeaway message. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. I sorry, I didn't talk about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you say that again? Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, in terms of not word prediction, in terms of the document classification. So here, basically, like uh, when you when we learn the if you have word document network and we apply our line model and then we can get the word embeddings and for document embeddings we just take the average word embeddings uh, and then treat the the doc and, and then use document embeddings for classification and for paragraph vector so essentially it's um, it's, uh, it's Google's uh, document embedding model and just using the the the, the embeddings uh, the do, the embeddings learned by the model for uh, for document classification that's how we compare our line with word document network. Uh, with a, a paragraph vector. Do I answer your question? Or? Okay. okay, so, uh, so, um, so, so, so non-embedding uh, non is, uh, is, is a very hot topic. So besides the three of, of approaches we introduced above, there are many following up um, work. Um, so including different variants of the three models and also models for learning reputations um, um, for networks with multiple views and also uh, learning reputations for networks with node attributes and uh, learning reputations for heterogeneous networks. And also for uh, for for the three models, we are actually learning uh, repetitions. We only the structures and the node repetition can be general useful for different tasks, but but not opt optimal for specific tasks, right? And and also now there's a growing interest to learn task specific network embedding. So let's look at some um, some variants of the three models. So there are some models uh, try to leverage global structure inf information to learn better node embeddings. There are also um, uh, some approaches. Uh, uh, which is which, which is nonlinear nonlinear methods based on all the encoders uh, try to learn better node embeddings and also there are some work um, um, uh, to learn node embeddings for directed networks and also side networks. Okay. So next, I'm going to introduce how can we um, how can to, how to learn uh, node repetitions for networks with multiple views. And so because in real world networks, uh, actually there are, um, there can be multiple types of relationship between Nodes, for example, in uh, for users in Twitter, uh, we can we can have relationship between like uh, the following following relationship, and also we can have relationship like rotating, right? So there may be, there are many types of relation relationship between nodes in in, in 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 between the nodes, and every type of relationship actually actually induce a proximity between the nodes, which defines a view of the uh, of the network. So when there are multiple types of relationship, there are multiple views of the of the network. Okay. So, so the information in different views are usually complementary. So, so, so therefore, it's it's, it's very natural to um, to think about how can we learn better node repetitions if, if we have multiple views. How can we leverage information in different views to learn uh, robust node, node repetitions to learn better node repetitions. So we propose an uh, approach based on um, um, uh, called uh, co-regularization. Co co um, so essentially, um, so every node will have uh, robust node repetitions. So every node has, has a very good node repetitions, and also we have uh, uh, repetitions for every view. 
So, so every, every node have uh, different repetitions in different views, okay? And the node repetitions, so, so the view-specific node repetitions are used to preserve the structures of different views. So these are the, so how, so this is um, the view-specific node repetitions. And once, um, so once we have the view-specific node repetitions, and how can we get the uh, robust uh, node repetitions? So basically, uh, the intuition that we want to promote the collaborations of different views to vote for the robust load repetitions. So, so here we have uh, node repetition for every view, and we want, to, based on this uh, view-specific node repetitions, we want to vote for the robust node repetitions. That means every, every, every view has a weight, okay? And, and also, like, the, the robust node uh, repetition can serve as a regularizer to regularize the view-specific node repetitions. In other words, we don't want the view-specific node repetitions to to stay uh, too far away from the robust node repetition. So this is an essential idea of the, uh, of the co-regularization approach. So, so mathematically, the, the object function of the co-regularization framework can be defined in this way. So it has two parts. So one part is the objective to preserve the structure of different views. So this is the objective line for every view, right? So this is the first view. So the first part is the objective for every view. So basically, try to preserve the structure of of of, of different views, and beside this, uh, besides this objective function, we also have an um, object object function called co regularization So this object function basically measures um, the discrepancy between the node uh, b the discrepancy between the view specific uh, node embeddings and the and the robust node embeddings. So the so xik is uh, the view specific node embedding of node i, and xi is um, the robust embedding of node i. And lambda ik is the weights of uh, weights of views of, of node i. So this is um, how the co-regularization approach works. So um, so according to this uh, uh, regularization term, if you want to if you minimize um, this uh, object function, we can see that. The robust node uh, representation is simply a, a linear combination of the view-specific node representations and the and the weights um, and the weights of the views um, uh, and the, the coefficients of the combination is just the weights of the views for different nodes and and we and, and we, to learn the weights of the views we use a, a neural attention mechanism which is used in machine translation so we define the views for every node uh, using a soft max function. So here, the XIC is a concatenation of the of the view specific, view specific representations for node i. So basically, you can represent the node i, and zk is a, a embedding or representation of of, of view k. So basically, what it does is like it calculates the similarity between uh, the view and the node, and then th this is similarity similarity between the node and the and the and the view. So this defines um, the weight of the view for node i. Okay. And in order to learn the um, in order to learn the um, the weight of the view for every node, um, so we use uh, we use a supervised task. So we feed the robust node repetitions for uh, for external task. For example, we want to classify a, a node. So here we, and then the object function is to minimize uh, the object function for external task. For example, uh, node classification. And then the whole um, uh, the whole model can be trained through backpropagation. And these are the results of uh, node classification. So we can see that our proposed uh, co regularization framework outperforms, um, um, uh, outperforms uh, the approach uh, without learning the weights of the views. In other words, uh, we treat every view equally. And we also outperform uh, single, single view, um, um, outperform uh, the, um, the embeddings learned with, uh, with the best single view. Okay, next, uh, the embedding with. Uh, the embedding learned either with line or node vector. So these are the results of um, node classification. Okay. Uh, so there are, there are also like uh, many work um, uh, trying to learn re node repetitions uh, with node attributes. For example, uh, there are approaches uh, trying to learn node repetitions with uh, text information and also uh, gender, location, and text, right? And and actually, Kip, uh, Kip actually proposed a very general model for learning node, node repetitions uh, based on variational order encoders. The essential idea of, of the variational order encoders 
is is the model try to encode the node by using the neighborhood neighborhood structure information and also the attribute information. And then it try to decode the neighborhood structure. So it's so basically you have an encoder, decoder. The, encode, the, the input of the encoder is the neighborhood structures and also the attribute of the nodes. And for decoder, you just try to decode the neighborhood structure of every node. And the whole, um, and the whole model is trained by using back, back propagation. Okay. Um, there are also uh, many works trying to, um, trying to learn node representations for heterogeneous networks. Uh, for example, uh, so Chan actually studied learning uh, heterogeneous network embedding with uh, deep new, new networks. So here they try to uh, embed heterogeneous networks of images and text. So they built, uh, the first build like a uh, very deep neural networks to try to uh, embed the uh, uh, image and or, or text. And then, the, and then they try to make the embeddings of the link objects close to each other. For example, they try to make the embedding of uh, Make the embeddings of uh, if, if like if two images are connect to each other, to, to try to make the the embeddings of the, the two images close to each other. And if an uh, ima image is uh, is linked to a text, they try to make the embedding of the of the image is close to the embedding of the text. And for the embedding of the image and, and text, they, use, they both use uh, convolutional neural networks. Okay. And the Chen actually studied uh, how to embed heterogeneous star networks. So for heterogeneous networks, basically we are we are we have a center object. So let's say here we have a, uh, the center object is a paper, and then we also have multiple attributes. Here we have um, author, keyword, and venue, and the, the year. And the goal of heterogeneous star network embedding is try to embed the um, embed the uh, center objects. So they propose a new network, uh, which try to which first try to. Uh, uh, embed the attributes first. So here we have keywords and references and the venue. So, so their model uh, uh, first try to embed try to embed every attribute. For example, we have embedding for keywords, and we have embedding for for the reference, and we have embedding for the venues. And then they aggregate the aggregate the embeddings of, of all the attributes to get the embedding of the sent uh, the sent objects. And then the embedding of sent objects used for an external task. For example, they want to do paper classification, and the whole and the whole um, the whole model is trained by back back progression. So, uh, so, so like uh, I just mentioned previously, so many of the previous work, like node vector, line, deep work, try to learn embeddings just using the, uh, the network structures, which can be generally useful for different tasks. So now there's a lot of work trying to learn uh, uh, tasks specific uh, embeddings, which try to uh, leverage, which try to uh, leverage supervised information for a specific task. Uh, so in our in our in our previous work, um, uh, so. So this works just like the work I mentioned to, to the question I, I answered before. So, so we we use the um, we use a node embedding to um, to learn semi supervised test representation. So previously, like uh, given a given a, a, a document uh, on structured test, so we can construct uh, word coherence networks and also word document ne networks from the text. So these uh, two networks essentially uh, encode uh, unsupervised information, right? And it doesn't uh, contain any supervised information. And besides these networks, and then we also introduce a third, a third network, which is a network between the word and labels. So here we use the example of document classification as an example. So besides these two networks, we also uh, in introduce the uh, uh, networks between the word and labels. So these networks actually encode the supervised information. And then we can join the three, we can join train the three network together. That means we can leverage both the unsupervised and the supervised information, and then we can um, we can learn on semi-supervised word embeddings. So once the uh, the word embeddings are learned, we for the document embeddings we still use a very simple uh, uh, way. Just take the average of the word embeddings in documents and and treat the document embeddings as the features of documents. Okay. So here are some results uh, um, of um, some results on text classification on non-documents. So we can see that our, our proposed our pro approach actually out outperforms um, the state art approach for um, for text classification, which is the convolutional neural networks. Okay, and these are the results on non-documents. 
And on short documents, we can see that our approach is comparable or a little bit inferior to convolutional neural networks. So this is because convolutional neural network actually considers the orders of the words, but our approach doesn't consider the order of the words because when we're calculating the document embeddings, we just uh, take the average of the word embeddings. We don't use the order of the words. Um, so another example of, of task-specific uh, node embedding um, um, is, is semi-supervised uh, graph classification with graph convolution, convolution neural networks. So in this example, so we are given a graph, and then and every node in the graph uh, is associated with a, a node feature, so which is uh, which is d dimension, and the and 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 for some of the nodes in the graph, we are given the labels, and our goal is to classify. Uh, the rest of the node. So this is our task, okay? And they also propose approach um, uh, to learn the node representations uh, using multi-layer graph convolution networks. So the essential idea of, of this model is, is try to um, update the embeddings of these nodes uh, using the information uh, of, of the node itself, like the, the features, the, 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 the feature of the node, and also try to combine the information from its neighbors of the, the node embeddings from its neighbors. So that's the essential idea of, of this approach. So most of, more specific, specifically, so, so, we are, uh, so we are starting from, so this is uh, um, the, uh, the, the first, uh, um, this is the um, uh, initial reputation of the, of the graph. So every node will be represented uh, with the node features. So here, edge zero is the node representations, and n is equal to the, the node features. And then, for every layer of the graph uh, convolution neural networks, so we apply the model um, in the node representations learned in previous layers, which will update the node representations, okay? And, and actually, every layer of the uh, graph convolution layer uh, is actually defines a propagation rule. So, so first, uh, the, the so here the the matrix A is the um, is a uh, adjacent matrix of the networks, and then the identity matrix is first added to the adjacent matrix, which actually tries to add the self links. Okay, and then this network is uh, first normalized into first normalized, and it, which becomes a matrix A hat. So the matrix A hat, which essentially defines uh, uh, the random work transition probability uh, between the nodes, which, which also can, contains the self-links. And then by multiplying the, the matrix A, A hat, so here matrix A hat with um, the matrix HL. So HL the, is the node embedding of previous layer. So by multiplying, my, by multiplying the two matrices, actually we are updating um, the, the node embedding by combining the information of the, the node embedding itself and also the, uh, the embedding of its neighbors. That's, that's what, what essentially this, um, um, the model does. And, and then after this combination, we first, uh, um, we first, uh, first do a nonlinear transformation. So here we have a WL, which is a linear transformation, and the sigma is a um, activation, uh, nonlinear activation function, and then we can get the, the new node embeddings, so HL plus one. Okay, sure. So X is uh, the node features is provided by the networks. So it's, it's, so, so it's for example like uh, 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 the gender of the users, the the profiles of the users. So it's the the, the, the features of the nodes. So it's provided by the by the networks. Okay. So in the, so in the first step, uh, so every node is just represented by the the features of nodes. And then for every uh, graph convolution neural network, so we apply the model to the node embeddings learned in previous layer. And then, and then basically, uh, we update the node embedding space on, um, um, so for example, so my, my reputation can be, can be updated by my rep reputation in previous layer and also the re reputations my, my neighbors. That's the essential idea, okay? And then after this um, uh, combination, we do a nonlinear transformation. Here it's like a WL is a linear trans transformation and sigma is a, the activation of a, a nonlinear non -linear activation function, for example, sigmoid or tangent or something like that, okay? And then we can get the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the new node embeddings, HL plus one, okay? 
or because of course for every uh, the, because when you update the node embeddings, of course you you don't wish your the new node embeddings too much different from your old node embeddings, right? So for example, in the first in the first layer, uh, your node embedding should be related to the the, the, the features your the, the the node features, right? So that's why we we add the the self link. Okay. And so once we got the node embeddings in the final layer, and then the node embeddings in the final layer are used for an uh, external task. For example, we, we want to use um, the final node embeddings to classify uh, the node. So the final object function is, 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 uh, is defined in terms of the uh, external, external task. For example, here we use node classification, and then the whole uh, model is trained using uh, back propagation. Uh, because you have to like uh, when when you have uh, basically just uh, take average, right? When you when, like for example in, in, in why because like uh, you can't just do uh, do aggregation like I mean that's what usually like page rank or random work did. Usually you have to do the normalization for because you have when you do voting basically you just combine the opinions from everyone and then. Uh, Take average, right? That's what people usually do in in random work stuff. Okay. And these are some results on uh, semi-supervised uh, graph classification. So we can see that uh, the uh, the graph convolution neural network actually outperforms uh, the state art uh, approach for um, for semi-supervised graph classification, uh, graph classification, which is a label propagation, right? And it also uh, and also outperforms deep work, which is definitely for sure because deep work is just unsupervised approach. Okay. Okay. Um, is this time for the? Okay. So we still have time. Okay. So next in the in the second part, I'm going to talk about um, net vis network visualization and also high dimension high dimension data vision visualization. So rem remember, oh, sure. Yeah, yes. So big I didn't hear quite uh, clearly. Oh, okay. Um so you're saying like uh have have we have ever I seen any word with taxonomy, right? Um, you mean in the word concurrence network, right? Um, I, I didn't see any example, uh, but I do know some work trying to learn the word tax taxonomy from the word embeddings. So yeah, there's, there are do, uh, some work trying to input the tax taxonomy of the words from the word embeddings, but I didn't see in my case. But there are, do some work, there are, there are some work in, I guess I, I read some paper in ACL, they have they have they have done that trying to learn the word taxonomy from the word embeddings. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So in the next part, I'm so in the second part, I'm going to talk about how to learn the how to visualize, visualize networks and uh, high dimension data. So rem remember that in the first part, when we're trying to learn the uh, uh, when we try to learn the node repetitions, and those rep rep node repetitions are usually used as features for for external tasks, for example, classification or node visualization or or, or link prediction. And those uh, and those node repetitions are usually uh, like hundreds or thousands of dimensions in order to achieve a very good performance. And here, uh, what about if the dimensions of the nodes becomes very small, like two dimensions or three dimensions? That means we can actually uh, visualize the networks um, in two dimensional in two dimensional or three dimensional space. Okay. And 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 actually, this can be generalized to visualize any, visualize any high dimension data as long as long as we can construct networks from the high dimension data. So here, uh, uh, we can actually use uh, we can actually can construct the KNS neighbor graph uh, from the high dimension data. And then we can visualize Kenya's neighbor graph in the two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. And these two-dimensional or three-dimensional repetitions are actually very useful for, uh, for, um, um, for understanding high-dimensional data and, 
and, and networks because they can be used for building uh, very advanced visualizations such as like scatter plots, network diagrams, and heat maps, okay? And in literature, the state art, uh, the state art approach for uh, high dimension data visualization uh, is, is TSNE. So which is proposed by Geoff Hinton and his postdoc um, Martin at that time. Um, so TSNE uh, is actually deployed in TensorFlow for visualizing the rep representations learned by deep neural, deep neural networks. So you, because we know uh, for deep neural network, what deep neural, neural network did is trying to map very high dimension data, like say images and, and text into low dimension representation, like uh, hundreds or thousand, uh, thousands, uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, dimensions. But you still don't know what does each dimension mean. So what people usually, usually do is try to map those hundreds or thousand dimensions to a very, very low dimension space, like two dimension or three dimension uh, reputation, uh, space, and then we can visualize uh, the re reputations learned by deep neural networks and then try to understand the, the semantics then learned, by this, learned by the deep neural networks. So it's, it's, it's now it's deployed in TensorFlow um, for, um, so visualize the reputations uh, learned by deep neural networks. So, so in this, uh, for, for TSNE, in the, in the first stage of constructing the k-nearest neighbor graph, so you first find the uh, nearest neighbors for all the data points, so which, um, which, is, uh, which is done by the vantage point tree. So once, um, once we can find the nearest data point for every, uh, for every data point, and then we have to, then we calculate the similarities between these data points, and this is done by using a Gaussian kernel. So here basically we, we measure, so we measure the, um, uh, so here dxisj is the uh, Euclidean distance between the two data points, uh, i and j, and then we calculate the distance, um, the, the, uh, the conditional probability from node i to node j, uh, using a Gaussian kernel. So this is how we calculate the similarity between the two data points. And, and, and this condition probability is further sim similarized into, into um, uh, is further similarized by taking the average of the two uh, condition probabilities. And then with these two procedures, we can construct the k nearest neighbor graph. And the whole procedure, um, um, the complexity of the whole procedure uh, with respect to the number of data points n is n log n. And this, and this can be very um, uh, computationally very expensive with the number of data points and becomes very large, okay? So once the, um, once the Kenyan's neighbor graph uh, is constructed, we have to map it into two dimensional, three dimension space. And in the, in the low dimension space, uh, we define the similarity between the two data points uh, using a, so using a normalized uh, student T distribution. So here, um, so here's a, a vector yi, the, the embedding of node i in the low dimension space. Um, and, and in order to do the visualization, we want to actually want to uh, preserve the similarities in the high dimension space in the low dimension uh, space, right? And then, so our goal is actually try to minimize the distance between the similarities in the high dimension space and the, in the low dimension space. And for the distance, we still use KL divergence. Uh, the, uh, we still use KL divergence. And the, the final object function, um, is defined in this way. And the overall complexity of optimizing this object function um, uh, is n log n in terms of, um, I mean, with respect to the number of data points n. And, and we can see that if the number of data, data points n becomes very large, uh, the complexity of this algorithm can, be very, can still be very uh, expensive. So based on the two stage, we can see that, uh, um, so TSN has, has several limitations that cannot scale up to a very large scale data sets because in the stage of both Kenyan's neighbor graph construction and graph layout, both the complexity is, is n log n, which is, can be very computation expensive. And, and in practice, we also observe that um, for TSNE, um, uh, the parameters, uh, the optimum parameters in, in different data sets can be very different. That means if you have a new, new data set, you have to empirical tune the parameters to get the optimal performance, okay? And, and this becomes very computation expensive if you have, have a really large data set, okay? And then we propose, so to, uh, to, in order to uh, scale up to really large network, really large, uh, to, in order to uh, visualize really large data sets and also networks, we propose a new visualization technique uh, called large risk. So large risk has a very uh, efficient uh, method to construct uh, the uh, approximate uh, Keynes neighbor graph, and on three million data points, um, 
So large width is actually um, uh, more than 30 times faster than TSN. Uh, large width also has a very efficient uh, model for graph layout, um, which, uh, which uh, the compressor which is linear to the number of data points. You know, for TSN, the, the compressor is n log n, but for large width, the, the, the complexity of graph layout is linear to the number of data points, which is very efficient. Uh, and on three million data points, uh, large width uh, is, is seven times faster than TSN. And the visualization generated by large width um, uh, are, uh, are also better than TSN. So besides, the parameters of large width um, are, very, are very consistent on different data sets. That means if you have a new data set, you don't need to tune the parameters. You can just use the uh, default parameters. So next, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, our approach, how can we uh, very efficiently and also very effective to construct a Keynes neighbor graph, and then uh, how to map the Keynes neighbor graph into two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. Um, so I will first talk about how can we uh, efficiently construct the Keynes neighbor graph. So our approach is based on the state-art uh, state approach for Keynes neighbor graph construction, the random partition trace. So which basically uh, partition the whole space uh, into um, uh, into different uh, uh, small regions and with multiple hyperplanes, and then the whole space uh, is uh, is organized in um, uh, in, uh, um, in in a tree in a tree, and with this tree structure, we can um, which we can very efficiently construct the Keynes neighbor graph. So more specifically, so we are starting from the entire space, which corresponds to the root node of the tree, and then. Uh, the algorithm uh, randomly sample and uh, a multiple hyperplane, uh, uh, randomly sample a multi hyperplane, uh, sample a hyperplane, so which will divide the whole space into two different subspaces, right? And these two different subspaces becomes the uh, the uh, the leaf node of the root node, okay? And we can recursively doing this for every leaf node, for every subspace. For example, for the the left one, we can we can further divide the, this, uh, this subspace into two small subspaces, which also become the root of, the, of, this, uh, of this, which becomes the leaf of, the root of this root node. And we can do uh, the same thing for the right hyperplane, right? So, so we can continue to, uh, to do this until the number of data points in one, in one small subspace uh, is below some threshold. For example, if in some small, for example, in this, in this subspace, number of data points in this subspace only have four data points. We don't need to, we don't do this uh, division anymore, okay? And then we stop, okay? So based on this, uh, based on this uh, procedure, we can construct, the, um, we can construct a, a random projection tree. And with the random projection tree, we can actually very efficiently construct the Keynes neighbor, uh, we, we can actually very efficient uh, construct the Keynes neighbor graph. So, so basically, if you have, um, so the basic idea is like this. So given a new data point, we we, tr we can traverse on this uh, uh, on this random projection tree. For example, if we have a data point in this in this uh, subspace, and then if we do the traverse and then find the, the sub subspace it belongs to, okay, and then for every new data point we can identify the subspace belongs to, and then we only we only compare we only consider like the data points in the same subspace are similar to each other. That means we do, if, we, if two data points, they, they, they are not in the same space, we, we don't think they are similar to each other. So by doing this, we are, we are, we are able to significantly uh, reduce the comparison, right? So of course, in practice, um, and because this all, 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 for, this, for this algorithm, all the, all the steps are, are, are random, so, so the accuracy cannot be very high with only one tree. So in order to improve the accuracy of the, the Keynes neighbor graph construction, we build multiple trees to improve the accuracy. However, uh, building many trees actually uh, reduce the efficiency of the approach. So therefore, um, we propose an approach, uh, try to reduce the number of trees. Um, so, so instead of building many trees um, to construct a very accurate Keynes neighbor graph, so we are uh, so we are from uh, less accurate Keynes neighbor graph, so which is which is constructed with only a few trees, and then we try to improve the accuracy of the uh, the accuracy. We try to improve the accuracy of the Keynes neighbor graph. So we use the idea of uh, called like um, neighbor exploring. Neighbor exploring. So it's, the essential idea is like we think like a neighbor of my neighbor is also likely to be my neighbor, right? 
So this, uh, so if you think about the, so this actually very really relates to the second order neighbors defined in our, our line model. Okay, so basically, so we 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 think like the second order neighbors can also be candidates for my my first order neighbor, neighbors. So by doing this, we can by iteratively doing this, we can uh, improve the accuracy of the Keynes neighbor graph very significantly. Okay, not sure. Random partition right? Yeah. yeah, right, sure. The last neighbors? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference uh, with uh, not having the last leaf? Uh, so you are saying like you first uh, um, um, you first uh, divide the the lip note. I I sorry I didn't quite get it. Can you say again? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So that's exactly the algorithm we build on. So so for the random projection trees, we are so so the random projection trees actually we are. We are just use Illinois, and then we improve the um, we improve the um, the efficiency um, of Illinois actually. So our our, our model is built on top of Illinois. So Illinois essentially use the uh, use the uh, random projection trees. Yeah. So. Okay. I, yeah. I think sure we can talk more offline. So. Sure, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, actually, we don't need to, um, okay. You can, we can go back to how we construct the, uh, we can, how can we, um, so, so when we calculate the uh, similarity, we don't need to uh, compare with all the with all the data points. We only calculate the uh, distance between the node and its uh, nearest neighbors. And usually, the number of neighbors is not so large, so so it doesn't have the memory issue. So you don't need to compare the node and all the other neighbors. You just need to compare the node with its neighbors, right? So let's um, so let's look at some uh, results uh, uh, to compare the efficiency of different random uh, different um, algorithms for constructing the Keynes neighbor graph. So here the axis is the accuracy of the Keynes neighbor graph, and the y axis is the running time of different algorithms. Um, and these are results on three million data points. So for every um, and for for every uh, algorithm, uh, we have multiple data points. Um, um, and this is achieved by using different value, different uh, values of the parameters. For example, for random projection, for random projection trees, we can use different number of trees so that we can have uh, um, Keynes neighbor graph with different accuracy, of course, different uh, uh, running time, right? And we can see that, uh, and in this uh, in this figure, the lower right corner are the best results. So we can see that uh, large with significant output performs the efficiency of the of TSN and also outperforms the the state the state art approach for random projection trees, which is essentially the annoy um, which is essentially the annoy uh, target we built on. Okay. And and um and and on three million points, in order to um get a ninety five percentage accuracy of Keynes neighbor graph, so TSN takes as long as uh, sixteen hours, uh, but large ways only takes uh, twenty five minutes, which is uh, more than thirty times faster. So once the Keynes neighbor graph um, is constructed, oh, so we have to map it into two-dimensional, three-dimensional space. So the essential idea is still we try to preserve the similarities of the nodes in the two-dimensional space, 
and we want to keep similar data points close to each other, and, and these similar data points uh, stay far away from each other, okay? And to do this, we first define uh, the probability of observing a binary edge between two data points uh, using uh, this, this object function. So here, the vector yi, the, um, the embedding of node i, and the yj is the embedding of node j. So basically, we can see that if, if like, uh, two nodes are very, sim are very close to, uh, two nodes are very close to each other in the low-dimensional space, then it's very likely to observe an edge between them. And this is how, uh, how we define the probability of ob observing a binary edge between two nodes. And based on this definition, we can also define the probability of observing a negative edge. In other words, the probability of not having an edge between two nodes, which can be defined like one minus this probability, right? And we can also define the probability of observing a weighted edge between the nodes, uh, which, um, which and, and the weight of the edge is, is, is put on to the exponent of the, the prob probability, okay? And, the, the, and then the overall object function um, of the graph layout is to maximize the likelihood of the, um, the, all the ob observed edges, including both the positive edges and also the next edges. The next edges means there's, there doesn't exist any edge between two nodes. So by maximizing the likelihood of the positive edge, so we can make similar, similar data points close to each other. And then by maximizing the likelihood of negative edges, we can make uh, these similar data points uh, stay away from each other, right? And in practice, because uh, there may be uh, many uh, negative edges, and, and, and we render samples on negative edges, which turns out to be still very effective. And the whole process and the whole uh, process is optimized so a synchronous stochastic gradient descent, and the overall time complexity is, is actually linear to the number of data points, which is very efficient. Um, so these are um, so these are um, so these are um, these are the efficiency uh, of um, uh, compared between TSN and large risk. So the access is. Um, is a percentage percent of data sampled from three million data points, and the y-axis is the running time of, of the two models. So we can see that a large risk uh, significantly uh, uh, outperform TSNE, especially when the number of data points becomes very large, right? And this is because the compressor of TSNE is, um, um, a, a, the, perform, uh, the compressor of TSNE with respect to the number of data points and is n log n, and the compressor of, of large risk um, is, is linear to the number of data points, so which is, uh, which is, which, which is for sure uh, uh, outperforms uh, TSNE. And on three million data points, uh, TSNE takes as long as um, 45 hours, but large risk only takes 5.6 five, uh, five, um, hours, which is uh, seven, five, seven times faster than TSNE, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> So we also compared the uh, visualization quality generated by different algorithms. So, so, so it's in practice actually very difficult to compare uh, the visualize com compare the quality of two visualizations. So intuit intuitively, uh, for a visualization, if we if we make, it can make uh, data points with the same label close to each other, then it's likely um, it's a good visualization. So therefore, so we measure the visualization using um, using um, by we measure the quality of the visualization by using the classification accuracy uh, with k-nearest label uh, on the low dimension space. That means if um, if the labels of my labels um, are the same with with mine, then it's likely to be a good visualization. So this is the basic idea, and 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 we try different config, config, configuration comparison. And for large risk, we also we always use the default parameters. And for TSN, we use both the default parameters and also Parameters, uh, parameters optimal, optimal tuned on different data sets. So we can see that. Um, so this is, these are results of the uh, Keynes neighbor graph, uh, Keynes neighbor uh, classification. So access is the number of neighbors used in the Keynes neighbor classifier, and the y-axis is accuracy. So we can see that. Uh, so large risk out, uh, slightly outperform TSN with optimal parameters, but but it significantly outperform TSN with default parameters. However, in practice. Um, uh, empirical tuning the best parameters on large data sets is very time consuming. And, and in our experience, actually, we found that the parameters of large risk are very stable. And basically, if you have a new data set, you can just try the default parameters and you always can, can give you very good results, uh, very good visualizations. Okay. Uh, I think we can stop here, and then later I will show, I will show some, 
uh, uh, fancy visualizations. So hope you guys can come back. I'll show you some good visualization. Thanks. <laughs>